Thank you everyone for joining uh, this afternoon and uh, to those that are dialed in remotely, thank you very much for those that are dialed in from uh, a very, from far over the world and uh, where it's very late or very early or the middle of the afternoon. We do really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, today our panel is going to be talking about uh, use cases and sharing their experiences with Manners. Manners is the mutually agreed norms for routing security. Uh, for those that were on the earlier call this morning, uh, you would have heard uh, me talking about this uh, with people and talking about what the actions are, what are mandatory, what's optional, and talking through various ways in which you can achieve uh, being Manners compliant. Our first presenter tonight, is, or sorry, this afternoon, is Aaron Murray uh, from Rianne's, and Aaron's going to be talking about the implementation of Manners framework at Rianne's. So I'd like to introduce uh, Aaron and uh, hand over to him. Thank you, Warwick. Um, and thank you everybody for uh, allowing me to be here today and uh, participate remotely. Um, uh, Aaron, Aaron, just one moment. We'll just get yes. to pin your video so that, uh, so that you're on the screen. That's something I can do. Um, pin, has that done it? Uh, no, they're just going to go up and do it on, uh, they'll need to do right. it on the screen. Hang on one second. I'll just print my own one. Okay, that doesn't make sense. Could we get someone to pin Aaron's uh, video? Because currently we're seeing the um, blank screen. Just give it a moment, Aaron. Uh, they're just working through it. No problem. Okay, you are good to go, Aaron. Oh yeah, I see my uh, see my slide up there. Cool. Um, yes. So uh, again, thank you uh, for having me and allowing me to participate in this session remotely. Um, I'd have loved to have been there, but uh, unfortunately, circumstances didn't work out. Um, yeah. So I, I'm I'm here to sort of discuss or talk about sort of the history of of RIANs and the routing security space and how that sort of allowed us to move into manners and manners compliance and and forwards from there to uh, improve our own uh, level of sort of routing uh, information sanity um, and uh, security for our our membership. So um, most of you probably saw this slide yesterday uh, when I was talking about RPKI, but you know, RIANS is, is relatively small, but we have a reasonably large uh, footprint um, throughout sort of the Pacific um, and into the US and Australia. Um, we have a mixture of internet handovers, end run handovers, private interconnects, and of course uh, our member internet uh, service and um, end run handovers as well. So RIAN started in 2006. Um, it's actually not that long ago when you think about it. Um, but right from our inception, we did have route filters on all of our uh, customer connections. This was actually put in place by uh, Telstra Clear at the time, who uh, sort of contractually ran uh, RIANs. Um, and all of those route filters were all handcrafted. And that did us OK um, for, for quite some time. Um, but uh, in around 2015, we decided we needed to do a bit more. Uh, and so the next step for that was um, actually to pull all of our member and Rianne's routing information into an IP address management database uh, so that we could manage it all centrally. And from there, um, that actually allowed us to start automating. Uh, we started off by automating our RIANs and our member um, IRR entries. Um, this was actually a requirement uh, handed down on us uh, at the time or, or um, 
gently nudged towards us by Arnett, um, who was actually providing our um, internet and NREN connectivity services at the time. Um, but obviously, it was a great step forward for us, so we were happy to, uh, to implement that. Um, and as soon as we had all of that information in our IP address management database, uh, it became very easy to start automating our route filters on uh, member edge as well. So from there, we sort of sat around on our hands for a little bit. We had a few ideas about what we should do in the future, but we never really prioritized any of it um, until um, Manners came about. Um, and we saw in Manners actually a real potential and a real um, alignment with Rian's thinking in the, in the routing security space, but not only in alignment with what we were doing currently, um, but it actually gave us a really formal uh, and, and concrete next steps for what we should be doing for routing security. So uh, we were very happy to jump on that pretty early. So uh, as a part of that in 2019, um, following on from that in 2019, we created our uh, first RIANS rowers. Um, unfortunately, as APNIC doesn't have an API um, to create these, they were had to be created by hand. Um, but we did actually implement, uh, based on our um, IP, uh, IPAM data, um, we implemented checks to ensure that our rowers uh, in APNIC were actually uh, matched up against what we had in our IP address management database. So from there, we then enabled uh, route origin validation, as I was talking about yesterday, on our upstream edge. Um, that was in late 2019, actually December, right before the Christmas break. It was a very brave move. Um, and we carried on from there. Um, we only had a couple more steps um, or a few more things to do in order to actually ensure our uh, managed application approval. So we went through all of our various websites that we connect to, uh, that, that we have um, accounts on with various bits of routing information and things like that to make sure all of our contact information was up to date. So that's uh, RADB, where we um, held all of our IRR information at the time, uh, as well as peering DB and uh, who is, which is hosted by APNIC for us. And so once we'd made sure that was all up to date, uh, I filled out the form to actually uh, apply for um, manners and it got improved, approved in around April, 2020. Um, so there was still a bit more for us to do. Obviously there were some recommended actions as well as the required ones that we had um, we had completed. Uh, and so as a part of that, we uh, continued on and uh, enabled RPKI um, route origin validation on our members. We hadn't done that earlier because we did have our strict route filters. So there was no way they could send anything, any addressing onto the internet that, uh, or any routes onto the internet that didn't belong to them. But what route origin validation actually gave us was assurances that they were advertising their routes with the correct origin ASNs. So we turned that on, um, that was relatively easy, um, and then we moved on to actually uh, working through enabling uh, anti-spoofing ACLs on all of our member edge handovers, um, which we're currently still working on, um, and we can't be more than a couple of weeks, maybe a month, depending on, uh, on how much pushback and feet dragging we get from our members. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, as, as it's the, sort of the, the process that we're working through at the moment, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we went about, um, or how, how we are in the process of going about um, enabling um, anti-spoofing ACLs on member handovers. Um, in, in theory, or at a high level, you know, you can think it's, it's quite an easy thing to do. You just turn it on, people can't talk with any addressing that doesn't belong to them. Um, but... In reality, it's not that simple. Uh, customers can be multi-homed, or maybe there's something there that that we don't know about, uh, or maybe you know they they have a link net with another ISP that they are actually sourcing data, uh, you know, sourcing an at or something like that on. So we've got to be very careful that we're not going to go and break actual production network um, as as a part of rolling this out. So in order to do that, we started off by rolling out a safe version of our RPF filter, our um, anti-spoofing ACL. Um, as you can see there, that first term, um, that's just the source prefix list. Yep, it's if it's your prefix list, in, in this case, it's the example of the RIANs 
um, corporate network. Um, we treat ourselves just like we treat any other member. So if uh, if it's coming from the uh, source prefixes that are in the list of RIANS prefixes, then we allow it. Simple as that. Um, the internet is never as, as simple as you want it to be. Um, and so if people have multi-homed connections, for example, they might have link nets that do need to participate in the internet, um, do things like send unreachables and TTL exceeds and potentially respond to uh, ping, which I much prefer everyone does. Um, and so in order to do that, um, you know, if it needs to send that data, it might actually follow its default route that might come back through RIAN. So even if it's a link net on another ISP, that, that data does need to be sourced or those packets do need to be sourced and sent through uh, the RIAN's network um, following that default route. So in order to facilitate that, we have um, just allowed with, with a policer some, some additional types of uh, specialized CMP packets that, that facilitate internet use. Um, and then at the end there, you can see it's our term final. That is basically drop everything else. Um, but in the safe version, we obviously don't do that because that could be um, disastrous for member networks. And so we started off by just adding a counter so we can see how many of these packets are hitting this term um, and just accept it. From there, that allowed us to pull all of that counter data um, from across the network and see which of our members were actually sending us um, packets from addressing that we uh, didn't believe they should be or we didn't know about. Um, for the most part, it was actually pretty good. Um, uh, most people weren't, um, and that's probably the ones mostly that are single homed off of us. Um, so they were pretty easy. But there are definitely some members who are sending us uh, packets um, sourced on addresses that that we don't know about. And in fact, in the case of uh, of the MOE one that you can see there, which is you know three quarters of a million packets over, I don't know, I think it was a period of a couple of weeks. That's actually uh, quite quite an interesting one because it's uh, to do with how their edge works and RIAN CPE running BGP. So basically what was happening is packets were heading through one, being routed back around to the link net of the router um, and arriving at the router on the other side, not via the RIAN's internet service, but via the MOE um, internet service. So it was completely legitimate um, traffic uh, to our router, which our router would have subsequently dropped anyways, um, but uh, uh, it came in on the wrong side, and so it looked like it was being originated from MOE themselves, so um, that, that, that was an interesting one, but you might find instances where, um, as I say, um, you might get some um, dual home customers with link nets who are just sourcing traffic potentially, in which case it won't be very redundant, um, or are um, sending um, you know, responses to internet scans uh, or just ordinary background um, types of traffic uh, back through their default route. So we're in the process of tracking these down. We're using a mixture of enabling logs on these uh, filters, uh, as well as if we really need to drill down into them, we can enable SFlow or JFlow to really look at whether that data is, um, you know, legitimate network traffic. So that takes a little bit of time, but it's it's not too bad. Um, and fortunately for us, we we only have a few members who are, are uh, we're, now we only have a few members who are actually doing that. So it's just something we're working through at the moment, and and hopefully over the next little while we'll we'll turn them. Uh, We'll figure out what that is and then we'll um, enable the final one um, which discards all of that traffic um, obviously uh, before we do this we'll communicate with the members let them know hey we're going to make this change and uh, if you have any issues with it here's the addresses that we're looking to actually drop um, if you have any issues with it get back in touch with us if you have any issues after this date get in touch with us and we'll see if we've broken something so some very quick learnings from this, this whole process. Um, I only arrived at RIANS in 2016. So a lot of, it, you know, a, a large amount of it was actually before my time, but most of the manners, uh, all of the manners stuff was, was during my, my tenure. So the first thing is uh, running security is everyone's responsibility. And in fact, the reason manners exists is actually entirely to protect the internet from you, because it's very hard to protect yourself from the internet in, in routing security. So we've all got to do our bit to uh, protect everyone else from us. Community and collaboration is, is key. Um, 
always look for incremental improvements. Don't figure out how you can solve every problem all at once. Just do them bit by bit. Maybe not as slowly as, as Rians did, which was over a period of you know a good um, eight or 10 years. Uh, you can certainly uh, condense it down into, uh, into maybe 24 months if, if you're really um, uh, working, on, uh, working hard on it. Maintain an IPAM, really important. Um, you need a data store in order to um, build all of your automation off. Um, and automate, 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 um, generate configuration. No one wants to handcraft routing policy. Uh, it's prone to failure and it's prone to getting out of date. So um, automate validity tests and config generation. And finally, uh, routing security. It's a journey. It's not a destination. You know, we're here. We've got all these ticks now. Um, if man has decided to uh, in the next you know, three weeks change uh, spoofing from a recommended action to a required action, we'd lose that tick um, until we finish rolling that out. It's 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 a journey um, and, and they're always looking at how they can improve things and we're all looking at how we can improve things as we go. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Aaron. Does anyone have any questions for Aaron in the room? Uh, and I apologize, I can't see the room at the moment, so I can't see if anyone's asking questions. Uh, I'm Chris Bruton from CNIC again. Um, so Aaron, I, I just wanted to confirm, so you, you use your IPAM as the basis for everything. So do you feed your RADB entries based on what's in the, the IPAM? Yeah, so um, it's, it's a little bit awkward because obviously RADB, you can only, um, create a single entry uh, for an individual prefix to OS, uh, sorry, AS um, pair. And so sometimes occasionally uh, other people or other ISPs that are, that are involved in this organization, um, potentially are their, their you know, secondary supplier and things like that, um, have already created RADB entries. So we, we have to be a bit careful. We can't just create entries for everything. Um, but what we do do is we have an ability to um, on demand generate entries which will figure out what's there it'll create a uh, sort of a diff of that and create all the entries um, via the radb um, api to actually fill that in but for the most part we're just doing validity checks to see what's changing over over time and seeing if that's different to um to what we have in our data store and again all of our routing policy um, all of our roas as i say we don't have an api to generate roas but we do check do validity checks. All of that's done based on our uh, on our IPAM information, um, as is our RPF, um, our anti spoofing ACLs. Do you you generate? Um, I mean, your your ROAs and uh, RADV, You put entries in on behalf of your customers for the most part. Yeah, yeah, we do do that because um, because we can, um, and it's much simpler than. Uh, asking them politely to uh, to do it themselves. Right, I understand, thank you. Aaron, I have a question for you. Um, so you, you, you mentioned uh, that you create entries in the RADDB and so forth, but do you delete entries or after uh, a customer leaves or things like that? Do you actually do a cleanup after yourselves? Yeah, we will. Um, We'll uh, look for any, uh, oh, to be honest, I didn't write the code on this. I'd have to ask uh, Dylan about that. I'd like to think that we look for um, entries that are now defunct, but that may not be accurate for me to say um, because we're actually not tracking what we used to own and no longer own. So we may not be removing that. Um, I will say though, we don't have very much churn. Um, our members all have a lot of address space, uh, which they're all beginning to sell at the moment. Um, but, uh, and so there's not very much new addressing coming in. So there's not very much churn in that space for us, um, but I can imagine that there, there can be significantly more for other people. No worries, thank you very much. Is there any other questions for Aaron in the room? If not, uh, I thank you very much, Aaron, for your, your excellent presentation and uh, really appreciate you taking the time to stay up so late to do this for us tonight. Uh, right. with, that, with that in mind, I'd like to invite Chris uh, Christopher from Scenic up to the podium to present.
uh, Christopher is uh, from Scenic and uh, he's going to be presenting to us on Scenic's journey and tools and techniques that they're using to do manners conformance. Uh, so over to you, Christopher. Yeah, I think we'll... Uh, um, yes, working on the PowerPoint. Not sure. I, I think yes. Do you guys on the Zoom see my slides? Yes, we do. Okay. Excellent. I think we're good. Um, so I'm from Phoenix in California. I'm um, sorry. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, our manners journey, which is relatively recent, um, and some of the tools that that we use to help us along the way. So, just very quickly about Phoenix, we we operate California's uh, research and education network called CalREN. We're kind of a consortium of Schools, universities, libraries, um, some other the colleges. One, um, we serve around twenty, at least twenty million Californians um, use our services one way or another through their their education and and research. Um, so. I started working at Scenic just in September of last year, and my first main project was getting us uh, approved as a manners participant. So what I found as going through this is we already met most or all of the requirements for becoming a manners participant, but we didn't have, I think it, it was mainly a matter of getting it organized and laid out so we could apply to manners. Uh, so I kind of went through and had to audit and summarize what uh, what we were already doing, and and that allowed me to submit the the manners um, application. Um, as I think Warwick gave a good overview of the manners observatory this morning, but I just wanted to highlight it again. This is one of the benefits of being a manners participant is being able to see all kinds of stats and information about your own networks and where you're doing really well and where where you have room for improvement and uh, with your the, the matters requirements. So I'm just going to go action by action. There's there's the four actions for network operators, and I'll just explain um, what how we accomplish these and um, and what tools we we use to verify these. So for action one, preventing propagation of incorrect routing information. So this is mainly all about prefix filtering. So what you accept from your BGP peers. Um, we have a defined process in place for prefix addition when we have new customers or peers who, who join us. Um, standardized templates in our uh, Genos or iOS configurations. Um, so it reduces the chance of error. Um, we're still not, we're not really, uh, we're not automating these yet. And that's one, one area for improvement because we, we don't have a good process yet to, if something changes after the fact, or if we need to remove uh, prefix filters and, and so on, we, we kind of do it on an ad hoc basis. So, that, so that's something we still have to improve, but we do have a very solid process in place for the initial addition of uh, this information. And then of course, we the other part of action one is verifying that your customers and actually own the, actually hold the ASNs and IP blocks. So we just check who is for, for that. And, and so, um, how do we verify action one? Well, one, one way is the, the CEDAR report, probably many of you are familiar with this, but 
Um, there's this covers a lot of ground, but but one thing in particular it's useful for is is bogus um, address space and bogus ASNs. Um, we have for a long time we had one particular customer who was using a bogon AS number uh, because I think somehow they forgot to pay their bill to Aaron and it just um, nobody knew how to resolve the problem. So um, we worked with them. Um, and as we were working on our manners application, we worked with this organization to resolve that problem. But um, but the CEDAR report really highlighted that. And then the the manners observatory itself, like I mentioned, it, it uh, makes it easy to see route leaks, misoriginations, hijacks, and, and so on. So um, as part of our manners application, they actually gave us access to the observatory before we had been approved, and that helped us track down all the, the remaining issues we needed to, to solve. Um, but now that we're a member, I, I review this very frequently, you know, at least at least once a week or more, I look through the observatory for, for any issues. Um, action two is preventing traffic with spoofed source IP addresses. So uh, there's a RFC from 2000 that's now a best common practice, best current practice, BCP 38, and this covers some very fundamental ways to prevent uh, spoofing. So we we implement these. Um, URPF is one way. We, we're only able to do loose mode, which, which doesn't really do as much as it, it should, it, it, um, it's not adequate to stop most kinds of spoofing. So um, we also do ACLs on our customer interfaces whenever feasible. We add these in conjunction with the, the prefix filters as part of our onboarding process for new, new, um, new prefixes. And then for verifying action two, um, we use the Kaida spoofer, at least that's it's a start. So um, I can't remember if anyone talked about it this morning or not, but um, but this is client software that you install on your own network that attempts to send out traffic spoofed source addresses. So we've installed the Kaida spoofer in, uh, we're currently running two instances of this, um, and we'd like to add more and more of these because it's kind of a voluntary way to uh, check your, your anti-spoofing capabilities. So in order to be approved for action two, you are required to run this from at least two network segments. So I didn't include the URL here, but um, if you just search for it on Google, the kind of spoofer, you can see results from many networks across the world who are running the, the spoofer software. Um, action three is to facilitate global operational communication and coordination. This is pretty simple. We just need to maintain our updated contact info. We hearing DB, Aaron, who is in RADB. This doesn't change very often for us, so it's just uh, mainly when there's staff, staff turnover, staff turnaround, we have to change the contacts. Like when I came on board, I had to update these and put my name in. And then action four is facilitate routing information on a global scale. Um, Manners offers two different options for this. One is to use uh, IRR and one is to use RPKI. We're not ready to implement RPKI yet. I, I gave a talk on our, our current state of RPKI yesterday, if you, if you happen to see that work in progress, but we do maintain updated IRR objects in RADB. Um, and we also proxy register objects on behalf of customers that, that can do it. I think our preference actually is to ask that the customer do it whenever possible. So that's kind of contrary to, to how uh, Aaron at Brands mentioned that, that they do it there. They handle it for the customers, but, but that's kind of just our, our convention to, to ask them to do it. And then action four. Um, we use this tool, it's NLNOG's IRR Explorer tool. This is one of my favorite tools. Uh, if, if you haven't seen it, you should definitely check it out. Um, basically, it compares all the ASNs associated with each prefix that's seen in BGP and RPKI, and then multiple IRRs. Uh, and kind of see Alt-DB, 
Aaron, uh, EBOI, I don't even know what that one is, level three rad B. So this lets you kind of just compare what entries you have in, in each uh, in each place, um, see what's missing, see what's incorrect, see what conflicts with each other. Um, so I highly recommend this. The Manners Observatory will also uh, point out actual problems, um, but I think it's not quite as comprehensive as, as this, uh, because this, yeah, it's not quite as comprehensive. Um, we have lots of room for improvement. Um, like I said, we, we don't yet generate our filters from IRR data or from, from an, an IPAM. Um, we kind of, we just make these manually, even though we do have standardized templates, we still rely on our engineers to enter in the correct prefixes. And same thing for anti-spoofing, we don't have a defined procedure to, uh, to generate these ACLs automatically. We also want to install the Kaida spoofer on many more network segments. Um, we would like to encourage our customers also to, to install this. Um, because I think the more people running this, better. Action three coordination. The main problem. This is sort of a not a huge deal, but our our ASNs that we actually use uh, don't are not officially assigned to CNIC. They're still assigned to the Cal State University system. So we're working on getting those assigned to us. But what that means is we can't. We don't have direct access to update the the contact info for those ASN entries in in Aaron. And then action four, again, we need to better identify or better define our internal procedures. As I was going through this, I found cases where our engineers just forgot to make updates to, to RADB. So um, I think we we just have to update our documentation, our internal documentation a bit. Um, and like I said, we, we do need to sign ROAs. This is a, a work in progress. Um, and overall, we would like to introduce a lot more automation into the process that keeps things up to date, automatically reduces the chance of errors. So that's kind of a long-term, medium-term goal for us is to automate as much as possible. That's it. So thank you. There's my contact info if you have questions later on. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, is there any questions in the room? Are you seeing any from your side? Not seeing any in here. Okay. Well, I'll I'll add a couple. Um, so the reason you saw in the IIR Explorer the B B O I, uh, that's actually an Internet Registry, a uh, routing registry, uh, like Level Three's Internet Routing Registry, RADDB, Aaron AltDB. They're actually all the Internet Routing Registries. That's why that one appears there. Um, I believe it used to stand for Broadband One internet provider in the US, but I'm not exactly sure if that's still the case, but uh, that's why that one's there. Okay, thank you. I, th I think on, on that note, I've also noticed in this tool, I, maybe it's a bit opinionated, but it strongly um, suggests to use Aaron's own IRR service, which we, we are starting to explore that. Um, but again, we have some issues with legacy resources, so we can't fully use that yet. Um, but I, I think that's also a manners recommendation if you look in the detailed documentation is to use the the, the re regional registry's own um, IRR rather than use uh, the third party ones like the like red I've just seen Aaron come off mute so I'm assuming Aaron would like to say something here. Yeah, I was just I was just going to point out the reason why sort of um, we should be moving not necessarily away from the likes of Aaron. ADB um, to our um, RIRs, IRR data, this is all very confusing, um, is, is actually your RIR, your regional internet registry, it actually controls, you know, those resources, it defines who is able to speak for what resource and therefore, um, because it's all behind authentication mechanisms and things like that, that actually makes some semblance of sense, um, you can actually rely on that data a lot more than you can rely on RADB data. Um, and on that, and I know um, Warwick has a very different opinion on this uh, to what I do, um, but th there's a reason we haven't implemented IRR-based um, route filters on our you know, upstream edge um, is just because we just don't trust that data. 
So I'll add to Aaron's comment and I'll actually challenge it uh, because <laughs> that's my role. Um, I actually don't disagree at all. Um, just to put a cat amongst the pigeon. Um, the wearing my manners hat for a moment, manners strongly believes that as uh, Aaron uh, referred to, you should be utilizing the, the re regional route, internet routing registries uh, databases as your primary source of knowledge. The problem with that is exactly as Christopher alluded to, which is legacies don't appear there and therefore we have to go to alternative locations such as RADDB and Merit, which then in, incurs the cost of, uh, if you look at RADDB's entries uh, and you run some reports against it for rowers and so forth, it is so full of incorrect routing information, it is phenomenal. Um, and so one of the things that from a manners perspective, and I know we've spoken about it with the APNIC trainers and others and so forth is, we strongly do recommend using the, the regional internet routing registries as the primary way of doing all of your authentication as much as, oh, sorry, authorization of the routes, if that makes sense, uh, as much as possible. Uh, certainly from my own experience within Arnet, um, we have seen a lot of interesting things. Um, there's no, how do I put it, controls on RADDB to a degree. Uh, people can put lots of things in, We've seen people put in a RADDB entry for 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0, and it was accepted. And that created a lot of interesting things for people's prefixes that were uh, uh, made. Now that was then removed and I can see Chihu has walked up to the microphone. So I'll wait for Chihu to make a comment. We can't hear you, sorry. Maybe, maybe go and use the microphone Aaron, Christopher's I'll, using. Yeah. yeah, I'll give you the other one. Sorry. Uh, you know, I just want to add, like, uh, the concern that, uh, you know, uh, a lot would have uh, regarding historical addresses. Uh, it's gradually going away because we have gone through the HRM project and, uh, you know, the, the historical resources would be on the whatever database uh, that we are managing, uh, you know, gradually. Uh, I think it will be completed within this year for sure. Um, so that part, uh, I think, will be soft. So especially for uh, NRENs within the APNIC region, yeah, I, I highly recommend you you go for that way. Uh, that's one small issue that I'm not 100% confirmed uh, or, uh, is like we also have the National Internet Registries here uh, for seven countries and economies. Uh, if you are under those seven countries and armies, you might need to uh, do additional check. I'm not 100% sure whether all the seven uh, NIRs are doing uh, IRL. Uh, do you know about it? Uh, I, I, be I believe some of them are based on what I've seen in the table. Yeah, JP but... Nick for sure. JP Nick yeah, for sure. So, um, but I, I, I would definitely suggest that people do their homework and review. Um, and as you say, with the, the historical uh, resource movement work that you guys are doing, uh, it's very much changing in the APNIC region, but for, for our other colleagues from around the world in different regions, that is a slightly different challenge that's uh, still to be overcome with the likes of Aaron and others in other locations. But uh, Christopher, thank you so much for your excellent presentation. Really do appreciate it. And thank you very much for uh, presenting face-to-face -face live over there. It's really appreciated. I would like to now move on and introduce uh, Jiang Zhu, who is going to talk to us about the implementation of manners actions at China Telecom. Uh, Jiang is currently on Zoom, so we'll uh, get him to share his screen and uh, go from there. Welcome, Jiang. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is John. I'm the network engineer at the China Telecom Americas. Uh, just let me get my slides on. And uh, it's an honor to be here, and I would like to share the China Telecom's experience in the implementation of Manus Actions. And uh, who is China Telecom is one of the 
is one of the major service provider in China and uh, with network presence in Asia, Europe, Africa, and Americas. And uh, China Telecom owns four major backbone AS, uh, 4134, 4809, 23764, and uh, 3678. Um, you can see from the uh, table, like uh, from Kader's uh, observation back in last December, there were 320 AS number and over 22,000 prefix uh, observed in the AS uh, custom, in the 4134's uh, customer cone. For the 4109, uh, over 627,000 prefix are observed. For the uh, AS2, um, 23764, there's a 150 AS number and 23,000 prefix are observed. Uh, here's the timeline for China Telecom to join Manus. In the, in the mid 2019, uh, we approach Manus to understand their objective, the principle, and the actions. After that, uh, CT start to work on the actions. In July and November 2020, uh, CT submitted application for these four ASN. In December 2020, three of them are ready as a Manus confirmant and city is accepted as a participant. Six months later in, uh, in June 2021, um, 4809 is ready by the Manus observation as well. Um, in the network size, as like the China Telecom, the, we put a lot of effort into the implement, uh, implementation. And uh, we do understand the filtering is the most important part. So the fundamental strategy is to strengthen the filtering. And first of all, is to revisit and rewrite all the inbound policy from our customer network or and every downstream SP. And we updated AS path filter to broad the route announcement that might potentially lead to our uh, routing list, uh, such as that we adding the AS path filter to to block the announce, uh, to block the AS path with uh, which has the uh, settlement free relationship with China Tech, with China Telecom. That that might be the first step to most easily to filter uh, most of the uh, customers' uh, care list routing list. And the second is uh, we uh, regenerate all the prefix list that extracted from the customer AS set. And the uh, second step that uh, we revise all the IP address uh, um, management database and we revise all the internal IP address uh, resource transfer policy. The idea is to allow extra time for the raw registration in IR and publish IRA before we actually announce the prefix. Um, because in many occasions uh, we forget to do so so that we generate the hijack instance or the um, or the route list instance. And the other heavy workload is to educate our customer and the downstream service provider. And uh, some customer doesn't have doesn't even have the AS set or the no uh, IR route object or the route six object. They don't know what RA is or they don't want to do the RA at all. So we have to teach the customer to understand the um, the correct IR object will help your prefix uh, visibility. All the ROA will help to protect your prefix being hijacked by someone else. Um, when dealing all this information from the IRR, or we have to check in the when the ROA is published, or we have to check when the route is announced. Uh, and during this procedure, there's a lot of troubleshooting. So it might be overwhelming in the process. Then the idea of the automated system comes up. You'll see from the uh, right-hand side of the slide, uh, we have the system, it's a system, we just call it the routing security system. The system database collects ROA from all the RIR trust anchor and ASZ object, the route object, the route six object from the IRR and together with the IP geolocation information, together with the city's own IP address management database. 
And the such database is an update on the regular basis. And on the other hand, the system takes in the BGP table from all the edges routers and compare with the information from what we have in the database. So to, it is to decide whether the announcement is legitimate and then push out configuration changes to withdraw the mis origin route announcement if we see that it's a, it doesn't match. And we are, also we filter the route with the RA invalid or all the IR mismatch or even the Bogan route. And you may see from the screen that this one of the print, uh, system, the print screen, um, each route represents one incident we identify in the from the system. And you will see from uh, you you were able to to see clearly from this uh, from this screen that uh, which prefix causes the incident, and the edge router host name means then where it was observed. And the first column, the customer neighbor AS, means who is sending over the route. And the observed AS path um, we see from this instant. And the actually correct origin AS number, it should be, is listed as well. On the, uh, the last column shows the detail error type after the, and then after the analysis, such as the uh, ROA invalid IR mismatch or the bogans and et cetera. And after the months of the preparation, a system started to roll out in the first half of the 2020 and finished deployment onto the 4104-4809-23764 by the end of the December 2020. And you will see from the managed readiness observation, the, the filtering percentage, the readiness percentage on the filtering action has been increased from the 6%, 60%, the maybe 75%, and the up to the 80%, and then to 100% later year. Uh, the percentage shows the, the level of conformance to the manners. And uh, with 100% indicates uh, it's, a, it's a full conformance in that month. And uh, that's what we the what we have been uh, been doing and keep improving the system and uh, keep fixing the fixing the um, the policy. And in the process, we do see some the some some other issue like the AS path uh, validation. Um, even though the the route announcement is a has correct origin AS, the path might be different. The the path might get tempered in the, uh, in the in the what we see from the prefix. In the path might be it doesn't look like it should come from the that way. So the so the uh, so the idea is uh, we are looking to see if any way to improve that, and um, and we do see the ASPA the autonomous system provider authorization. It might seem to be a way to solve the issue. Uh, we we kind of love the idea, and uh, we can looking forward to see the more development of the ASPA. And uh, last but not least, I would like to mention this uh, incident. The feedback might be quite important as well. Uh, from city's perspective, some of the uh, incidents are false positive, which means uh, a legitimate BGP announcement is marked as a routing incident. Um, inside the manners of the Observatory, there's a little chat box, and besides the incident, you may write your comment to to uh, to to comment if it is a legitimate update, and you may even provide more detail about this incident. It will help to reduce the number of false positive incident, and that will conclude my uh, presentation of the day. Thank you, and uh, and thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. And wearing my manners hat for a second, uh, I just want to, to comment on your comment there about the, uh, if you see an invalid or a incorrect data entry in manners observatory, um, that is, that's exactly the reason we put that checkbox there. 
Uh, we use two different data sources. We use BGP Streamer and we use the grip data. And so we're using the, your comments to help us refine that and also provide feedback to those entities to say, hey, look, this was a false positive or this was this, can you modify or train the machine learning in some cases to better identify uh, these in the future. So this comes back to part of the whole manners process as being a feedback loop because it's constantly changing. And as you mentioned, uh, ASPA, uh, we in ourselves uh, within manners are talking about what is the next phase of manners in terms of uplift again, because we're seeing things like ASPA or BGP SEC becoming an option potentially and we're talking about that in our community group. So we, we really would appreciate that if you uh, are a Manners member or you're interested in becoming a Manners member, reach out to myself. I'm the chair of Manners mm -hmm. uh, for uh, the Internet Society. Um, and uh, we can talk about that further and we would love to get more information from you on, on that, not just to yourself, but to everyone else in the room. Uh, please feel free. Are there any questions for Jaya? I do have. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, you mentioned that security system. Do you develop it yourself? Oh no, this uh, definitely not. Uh, this uh, it's a system work. So there we we do have the uh, contractor, and we do have the we do have the the virtual team. It's a team. Um, the map members from the uh, Beijing, from Hong Kong, and from the Americas. It's a collaborated. Uh, effort is not just one by one person. So uh, who deployed this system besides you? I think this system is very useful. Uh, maybe we can, uh, we can let others know this system and maybe this system can help other ISP. Um, we haven't thought about that yet. Actually, we thought it just uh, we might have something by our own, and uh, we just maybe each ISP have different issues and a different history, and uh, maybe they all have a different legacy issue. We the system we just we deliver is uh, solely for us only right now. But we can uh, but we can share more experience if it if it. If it, you will be interested in that. And uh, I'm not sure. Uh, have you uh, have you uh, deployed ROV? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, we do have the we do have the verification process, but it's different. It's a kind of different as the current the RPKI process. We put the data together uh, from the uh, RA from the IR data we just doing the matching by priority like first we check our a mismatch the ra invalid or and second we check the ir mismatch and we push the configuration change onto the router to filter out or withdraw the route announcement it's kind of uh it's a apk alternative way to to solve an issue because uh, we some of the router is uh, uh the 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 the, the the low on the router maybe we don't we don't able to to replace the router soon sooner or sooner so we try to bypass the issue like the like the router we have to we have to take in this RA process before we replace the router so another way of putting it is that they are managing the resource limits within the router very carefully to avoid yes. uh, having impacts where the router would crash because it's out of uh, capacity due to the volume of the, the entries that are being created, et cetera, if they were to do it uh, one yes, way or the other. Yes. Um, and that's and that, that comes back to, sorry, could I ask that we stop sharing the screen so that um, both Jiang and the rest of us who are online can actually see you in the room. Um, but one of the things that I was gonna mention here is as I mentioned this morning in the why manners is important, manners is not, you have to do it this way. Manners is about that you need to achieve a result. You can achieve that result as Jayang just talked about via multiple different methods, but 
here are some example methods that we recommend you look at. And the, the reason for that is, as we've just talked about, is the fact that not every one provider is of one size. Some are very small and they only have one upstream, so it's very easy to filter. Versus if you peer with a lot of people and you have a lot of route calculations to do and so forth, you need to think about how that's going to interact on your routers and so forth. So wearing, again, my manners hat as the chair of manners, we, we're looking for, for you to find ways that makes it work for you, but that you're uplifting to the manners standard, if that makes sense. And so there's no right or wrong way to do things. And that's why, as I mentioned earlier this morning, URPF is one way of doing things. ACLs is another. There are many different ways to do all of the actions, um, but it's what you have to find that works best for you to deliver that. Um, now, we've just lost the camera to the meeting room in uh, Kathmandu, so I'm not sure if that's by action or something else, because we're now just seeing the APAN 55 logo. Can we be heard by the people in the room still? Yes. Seems we just lost them. I think we, yes. Okay, we've been told to wait for a few minutes. Oh. It's okay. Okay, we can hear you. We we can hear you again, but uh, we can't see you. But thank you very much, Shayang, for your uh, presentation. That was really appreciative. Uh, we're really appreciative of you presenting on that now. Um, thank you. Our next speaker coming up is Zonghu Li, uh, who's going to be talking about manners implementation within CERNET. Um, now I'm hoping that he's got his laptop. Yep, brilliant. Uh, so. We will hand over to him and go from there. But while he's doing that, is there any question, any last questions for Jayanne? Okay, no worries. Thank you very much, Jayanne. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Jung Huili from Tsinghua University. Now I will give you a talk about manners implementation in CERNET. Uh, as Warwick mentioned uh, in this morning, uh, the manners initiative uh, was publicly uh, launched on 6 November 2016, uh, 14, and uh, CERNET was honored to be one of the initiative members of members uh, on manners and uh, here i would like to share share, uh, share you with uh, professor xing li uh, statement on why sonnet support uh, manners uh, here uh, we believe that the security stability and the resiliency of the internet operation can be improved by distributed and shared responsibility as uh, documented in manners as one of the largest uh, academic networks in the world, CERNET is committed to the manners actions. And uh, in accordance with uh, Professor Xin Li's commitment, uh, CERNET ha has been proactively uh, implementing manners actions, including both uh, compulsory actions and uh, recommended uh, actions. And uh, in this slide, you can see a, a snapshot uh, from the Manners uh, website, uh, which show you the latest status of CERNET performance uh, to the Manners requirement. And uh, I will give a brief introduction on the uh, on, on each actions in the next uh, slides. For, for action one, uh, prevent uh, propagation of incorrect routing information. Uh, as you might know, uh, the majority of CERNET uh, uh, custom networks are university campus uh, 
that works with IP address uh, block are uh, located from CERNIC. And most of the CERNIC customer networks are connected to the pop of the access of water by a dedicated, uh, dedicated link of the MAN, the metropolitan area network backbone. Uh, with static route, uh, route configured, not BGP. So uh, the major action uh, uh, for CERNET to do uh, so far, I, I think we think is to guarantee the correct announcement uh, of the CERNET S number and IP prefix uh, and all the aggregated IP prefix originated from CERNET. And uh, for the action two, prevent traffic from spoof, uh, spoof south IP addresses. Uh, just like most of the area in the world, uh, the in the end user subnet uh, inside the custom network is beyond the management of the CERNOC. and the token uh, and the uh, and the permission. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, demar demarcation point between CERNET backbone and the custom network is the interface of the uh, CERNET top access router uh, connected to customer access link. And all the main interconnection link. Uh, we confirm the, uh, the URPF validation has been activated on all certain pop access router interface towards the uh, customer networks, with the exceptional of the those load balance links. Uh, because as you know, uh, on, on that link, uh, the URPF check might cause trouble. And uh, later, I will I will try to uh, share you uh, some uh, possible solution uh, for for such kind of scenarios from from Tsinghua University uh, research team. And for the action three, facilitate uh, the global operational communication and the coordination, and with the assistance from uh, CERNIC and the CERNOC contact information is entered and maintained in APNIC RIR database. Uh, mm -hmm. which is made publicly available for who is earlier. And for action four, facilitate the routing information on a global scale, also with the uh, with the assistance from CERNIC. Uh, CERN CERNIC publicly documents all our intent uh, routing announcement in APNIC RIR routing registry, which includes its numbers and IP prefix originating from our own networks as well as the networks for which we provide the transit services. Uh, here are some uh, future plans uh, on the, on the uh, manners implementation in CERNET. For action four, uh, currently uh, CERNET has registered all the S number and IP prefix uh, that we advertise to other networks in APNIC RIR as uh, as number and uh, route objects. And in the future, uh, CERNET plans to create a valid RA uh, for all the CERNET IP prefix and all CISO prefixes we are legitimately uh, authorized to uh, originate. And, uh, and as you know, uh, because we have already carried out some discussion about RPKs quite Complicated. Uh, so our, especially uh, from uh, from our Cer CERNIC and CERNOC, they are quite. Um, they need to carry on a uh, comprehensive study on that and and try to try to get it done. And hopefully, it, it can be done by this year. And uh, as might be aware, uh, for the purpose of the IPv6 promotion and leverage, uh, CERNIC is actually composed of Backbone, one uh, pure IPv4 backbone and uh, one IPv6 backbone, uh, which has uh, which uh, the later one is known as 32 before, which has its own AS, uh, AS number 231910. Uh, and uh, so as one of the next steps uh, to meet uh, the manners performance requirement uh, from IPv6 aspect. Uh, we have we plan to kick off the implementation of the manner manage action in certain two IPv6 well, in the near future. And uh, in addition to the actions and the plan, uh, plans I, I shared uh, in the previous uh, previous slide, uh, I also want to um, share some uh, uh, consideration about the action two uh, in, uh, uh, in manners uh, and. Uh, 
and the formation, the, the demarcation point between Cernet backbone and the customer networks uh, at the interface of Cernet access router connected with customer access link or the magnet connection link. Not the individual uh, in, uh, individual end user sub subnet in the customer network, and uh, while the routing policy inside the customer networks is managed by customers themselves, now Cernet. So there might be some issues uh, needed to be take, taken into consideration for action two. Uh, the first one is the identification of single uh, home stub customer networks. You know. Uh, uh, maybe a little different from the uh, the other in NREN. Uh, besides the connection to CERNET, most of the CERNET customer networks also have uptake to the commercial ISP uh, uh, in China as the default route to internet, while no BGP peering with CERNET uh, for global R&D uh, route learning. So uh, as the identification, uh, Identification for the single home stub uh, custom network uh, mentioned in, in the action two is not accurate. Uh, there might be some mischarge on CERNET's uh, information to action two. So uh, on the diagram, uh, uh, from the diagram on the left, on the right, uh, you can see, uh, in spite of the URPF check uh, configured on CERNET, the packet from CERNET subnet with forged source IP address might be injected to the internet uh, by following the default route pointed, pointed to the commercial SP uplink. Uh, if on that link, uh, no RPF check and no net is, is configured. And the, and the second one is about the uh, granularity of the forged source IP address used by the, uh, the data source, uh, software, which I have tried to uh, discuss with Warwick in this morning. And uh, here, you know, because due to lack of the comprehensive understanding on the uh, mechanism of the CADA schools, all source IP address selection, we are not quite sure uh, whether there might be access to some, you know, uh, judgment by that software due to the granularity of false source IP address selection. Let's take, take a look at the, the three types of the granularity. The first one is the canvas network range. Uh, since CERNET can only apply URPF check, uh, check on the interface connected to the universe canvas network instead of access port, uh, access port to the in the user's uh, subnet inside the canvas network. So, so misjudgment might be made if the forged source IP address is selected outside of the problem in the user subnet, but still in the same canvas networks. From the uh, diagram on the on the right, I see uh, for the custom networks uh, who has, uh, who doesn't apply apply the URTF check on their link uh, on their in user subnets, and the packet from in user subnets with false source source IP address within the same kind of networks that can bypass the URTF validation configured on CERNET uh, uh, on the router. And and, uh, and similarly, for the main scenarios, CERNET so can only apply the URPF check on the interface connected to the main uh, uh, backbone instead of the down, uh, uh, downstream customer networks connected to the main. So the misjudgment might also be made if the forged uh, source IP address is selected outside of the orb and 10 percent networks, but within the IP address block from, from those 10 percent networks. Connected to the same man and bomb. So, also uh, from the uh, right uh, diagram, you can see that you can find in many scenarios, uh, CERNET maintains the connectivity to our customer networks by adding customer network static routes pointed to the main backbone. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, considering most of, most of the main backbone, not apply URPF check uh, on the link uh, connected to, on the link to their customer networks. So uh, similarly, the packet from the campus network one with the forged source IP address within the campus network two, which uh, both of which are all from the same man 
uh, ball, and uh, that can bypass the UIP URPF validation configured on on CERNET access water dedicated and by ball. About the third third one, there might be no uh, gradual clarity at all, but using private IP address uh, as for the source IP uh, address uh, because. Uh, in automation, we have no full understanding on how the data spoof software is working. So that's just some some get from us. So we just try to try to try to list all the possibility here. So for this case, uh, we think that should be work 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 for most of the scenarios, but not like the real spoofing action in customer networks. Let us just imagine how we can initialize a DDoS. Uh, Attacked by using private IP address, uh, the false source IP address. So that's not, you know, like a, a reality scenario. In, uh, in and uh, then uh, let's come to the last one, uh, uh, last one consideration about the action two, anti-spoofing for load balance links and uh, a symmetry, a symmetrical route. Uh, as mentioned in previous slides, uh, the URPF check does not work works well uh, on either load balance ba uh, link or uh, symmetrical route scenario. So maybe the Sava P, which is proposed by Tsinghua University Sava research team, uh, might be a better option. And here, here are some um, theoretical diagrams uh, about the Sava Sava P uh, technology. Uh, I'm not quite uh, involved in uh, Sava research project. Uh, so if you are interested in, in the Sava P solution, maybe you can try to contact our Tsinghua University uh, Sava P uh, research team led by uh, Professor Dan Lee. And uh, this is all for the uh, for my sharing on the um, manners implementation in Sonnet. Thanks. Thank you very much for that presentation. And it's quite interesting, as you said earlier this morning when we were talking uh, about the action two. And certainly, um, as, as I mentioned before, we treat that as an optional because there are, there are very limited ways that we can prove or disprove whether or not someone is truly stopping anti-spoofing or, or allowing it to occur. And as I said, there are certain situations where we know that it is legitimately occurring, um, but uh, it's uh, the, the the case of the best option at the time, I think is the way I'd put it. And we certainly um, will uh, take on any feedback and I am quite interested to hear more about Sava P. Um, but uh, are there any questions from the room? Sorry, I can't see the room, so I'm not sure if there are any uh, questions coming in from the room. Uh, no worries, hands here, <laughs> I think. <laughs> no worries. Well, with that in mind, I would like to say thank you to everybody who has uh, participated today and presented uh, on their manners implementation. Um, that has been uh, truly uh, really useful to hear how everyone is doing their interpretations of the rules or the actions, as the saying goes. Um, as mentioned before, I wear two hats in this conversation. One is as Arnett's Head of Network and Systems Architecture, but my other hat is as the Chair of Manners. So if you have any questions or concerns with Manners, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my details are on the net. You can find me, uh, but uh, you can contact me at warwickmitchell at arnett.edu.au, but uh, you'll find the details in uh, the Hoover app and so forth. Um, but with that in mind, unless there's any other questions from the room, uh, we will say thank you very much and hope you have a lovely evening and dinner tonight. Thank you very much. You thank all the speakers and all the audience. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks.
Thank you and bye.